Hello, and welcome everybody to another episode of Pod Strickland. I'm your host, Shwini Poon. This is episode 385. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Stacy. That is at StacyPatton89 on Twitter. Stacy, how are you doing on this uh, Monday morning? Chilly Monday morning. Uh, it's not too bad where I'm at. Uh, yeah, I'm all right. Good to hear. Um, all right, well... Before we get started, I do have to make a few announcements. First, we have Strickland has an Instagram. Check that out. That is at Strickland on Instagram. We are posting all kinds of new content on there. The Strickland also has a YouTube channel where you may be watching this podcast. If you are and you have not done so already, please hit like, subscribe to the channel. That'd be a huge help to us. Strickland also has merchandise, which you can find on our website at www.thestrick.land. There's a link that'll take you to the merchandise store, and you can find all kinds of cool stuff there. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, coffee mugs, water bottles, you name it, we've got it. Strickland also has a Patreon, which you can subscribe to. There's a number of different tiers. There's a $6 tier that gets you access to Pot Circle in this podcast that I host every Friday with Prez. You also get access to the Strickland Discord, where the conversation never stops. And you get access to... Our newest podcast, which is Takes from Obvious Bozos, that is hosted by Andrew Steele, a.k.a. Doug, along with Zach Blatter. Yo, there's further tiers. There's a $9 tier that gets you access to Strick and Roll, my solo pod, where I rant and rave about the next even more. You also get access to wonderful premium articles by Matthew Miranda, one of the best in the business. And now you get access to Strictly NFL, which, you guessed it, is our newest podcast that is about the NFL. That is hosted by Constantine Metricos. There are further tiers. It's a $15 tier, $30 tier, $50 tier, and a $100 tier. Those come with a variety of additional benefits, like listening on pod recordings, merchandise discounts, and even potentially co-hosting a podcast alongside yours truly one day, whether you choose to subscribe or not, and this will be possible without you. And none of this will be possible without Bet Online. The tournament is here. Bet Online is your bracket headquarters for this season with the best bracket contest out there. And odds, lines, and info on every game and every round right up until the national championship. You can access the most up-to-the-minute wagering information anytime from your desktop or your mobile devices and even track your bracket real-time all the way through the tournament. Head to the Bet Online app today and get in on all the action. Remember to use promo code BELIEVE, B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, the game starts here. We've also got a great new sponsor. I love betting my friends and betting them on anything. Sports games, who's fast? That's what Cut allows me to do. The Cut app is a peer-to-peer -peer social betting platform that's legal in 40-plus states. Cut has customizable odds, tracking capabilities, and an entire social network with group chats, user profiles, and rewards. All payments, no need for MMO. Use our promo code BELIEVENIX, B-L-E-A-V, NIX, for a 10% welcome deposit bonus. Don't forget that promo code BELIEVENIX, B-L-E-A-V, NIX. Cut, put your money where your mouth is. Um, so, uh, speaking of basketball the knicks played a basketball game on saturday afternoon uh defeating the nets 105 93 um not an extremely telling game in the sense that uh the knicks were not playing a very good basketball team and that became evident towards the end of the game um the but, knicks made a clean sweep though they won four oh over the nets this year is that was that the fourth one or is that the third? Third. Play uh, they swept them, so I don't think we play them again, do we? Uh, I have no idea. I just I only. Oh, we do. You're right. Yeah, April twelfth, we do. Uh, which yeah. the Knicks might lose if they're resting. I doubt that'll be the case, but. I mean, I hope that they're that we're in a position to rest, guys. Um, but, but so far, it's been a clean sweep. Yes. Um, I don't know. I guess just what were your thoughts on uh, the game in general? Uh, well, I mean, I think no matter what, at this point, given the injuries, you'll take any win you can get. You'll especially take a win um, where Jalen Brunson shoots, uh, it was like seven for 24. Mm -hmm. um, and, he didn't score the fourth quarter, and he didn't, take a, and he didn't, he didn't get a free throw the entire game, which is insane. And that's, and that's when the Knicks pulled away. Um, I mean, I think at this point we're used to just the officiating not being good. Um, credit the Nets, they... You know, Claxton and Bridges are the kind of defenders who, when he's not hitting tough shots, can give him some trouble. Uh, but DiVincenzo stepped up. Um, he's had a couple of good games of late after he slumped for a bit. Um, it's tough to call it a slump when he was relied on to do so much. Um, you know, to expect those kind of shots to go in at the insane rate he was hitting them is probably a bit much. Uh, it's a bit much for, I think, any player, to be honest. Um, and, um, and I thought... You know, they continue to show good mental toughness. Uh, the Nets, you know, whatever they lack in talent, this clearly this game meant a lot to them. Um, you know, it was a 
sleepy Sunday afternoon game. Knicks probably didn't come out with the best energy, but uh, they did what a good team does, even when shorthanded. They pulled away, uh, withstood the uh, withstood the the, um, the initial punch. Um, I thought in the fourth quarter, their defense was better, but um, the Nets did miss a lot of shots. But you know they were hitting a lot of shots earlier in the game. Um, so you know they got four games. I think you look at the schedule. They've got after the road trip, they have the Nets. They won um, tonight. They play the Pistons. And then they have Toronto and a trip to Wemby World. Um, so those four games are all the Knicks should be favored in, even without OG and Randall. You would hope after that four game trip, at least OG can come back. Um, so you know the most important thing right now, the six inches in front of your face is uh, is kind of holding the fort down for those uh, three winnable games that gets you to forty five wins and. Uh, they're only what are they just half a game back of the Cavs now after that collapse yesterday? Uh, yeah, that Cavs one. Yeah, they're they're half game. <laughs> was back. it thirty eight point lead? It's fucking. I mean, I, I think it got up to forty at one point. I, I was I actually so I, I was playing basketball uh, myself during this time, so I, I didn't watch that game. But like, I mean, look, I, <laughs> a lot of times like you could just tell when somebody hasn't watched a game, right? You just it's obvious. Um, and I am being very transparent about this. I didn't watch this game at all for a second. Um, but from the looks of it, it doesn't seem like I needed to watch this game at all. He double magic up to it again. I mean, yeah, the heat double, but but the Cavs are just without Donovan Mitchell, I think. Like, honestly, if you you want an argument for like why the Knicks should go get Donovan Mitchell, um, Watch them play this year without him. You know, like they're just not they're they're what they're a playing team at best, really without him. So I don't know. It's just this entire box score is just disgusting to look at. Um there was a guy I think who said he would cash up anyone who liked this tweet if Darius Garland didn't get he would cash up them fifty bucks if Darius Garland didn't uh score twenty points. He didn't even get to twenty minutes. He didn't even get to <laughs> He, he, he got he six scored, points. He scored nine. He scored nine. Literally, no one on their team had double digits. Oh no, no, sorry. This is Mobley. He nine. No, no. The box I'm looking at didn't. Um, I think yeah. they stopped updating it because Yahoo doesn't give a fuck. But but yeah, yeah. no. Mo- Mobley, Mobley um, is the only guy that scored double digits. He had fifteen. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, this they're just they're just not a good team without Don Mitchell. They're, they're I mean, and honestly, Darius Garland. Um, his development has been extremely disappointing. Do you think he's still bothered by the injury maybe? or Because he looked a lot better last year. I don't know. I, I just think that he he's just not been very impressive at all when I've seen him this year in any game. You know? Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's injury, but look, I, I just think when, when you're on, once you're back on the floor, really not interested in hearing about injuries at that point. At that point, like, once you're Clear to play, you're okay. Then, then I should just be okay with holding you to some standard of okay. Well, you're you're healthy enough to play, so I can expect you to be good. Um, and he's just not been. Um, so I, I don't know. They're 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 a mess, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, so that right pickings, if the Knicks can take care of business. Um, honestly, at this point, especially if Mitchell's really hurt. The Magic might even be a more um, intimidating first-round opponent. Um, Jonathan Isaac's been playing really well, um, still on a minutes restriction. Um, but, you know, if they throw him at Brunson, we saw, you know, when Brunson's off, it's it, it tends to – you know, I think he can – I think the idea that long defenders um, shut him down or, or just his kryptonite is probably overstating it because I've seen him torch them, but it definitely makes it more difficult, right? It's not as automatic as maybe when a smaller defender is on him. Um, so, you know, the magic loom large um, and uh, the Knicks, but, you know, next three games, take care of business. Um, Toronto, I think, is the best team when healthy, but it doesn't look like they're trying to win games right now. Um, the Pistons have given the Knicks some trouble before. Um, and um, and and Cade is usually a tough cover for them, especially without OG. 
So, uh, you know, that's it's not it's not like any of these are cakewalks, but if the Knicks can go 4 and 0 in the stretch and just we get some more clarity on OG and maybe even Randall, um, you know, things are looking really good um because they have, you know, they get the Kings again, but that's at home. Um I think they still play the Suns, but um but even after this four game stretch, the schedule isn't too hard. Um, so they could really close this out and run if, but they had to take care of these these three games before ostensibly OG comes back. Yeah. Um, look, I, the OG thing is what it is. I, I know that there will be people who I, I personally just don't feel any strong way about how the Knicks handled it. Um, you can tell me that oh, it's crazy for him to stay in that Portland game or he should have never played the Kings game or whatever. I don't think there's any guarantee that if those they didn't do those things that it would change anything about kind of like, you know, uh, how things have unfolded. I, I don't think we can know that or feel that way or, or say that uh, with any certainty. Um, but I'll say this, like, obviously the MRI, they, they said it came back clean which is obviously great news. Um, and it's good that we're playing teams that you would assume even without OG and without Randall and without Mitch that we can still beat, you know, Detroit, uh, obviously today, tonight, uh, they played Brooklyn on Saturday. Then they play the Raptors on Wednesday, who honestly, they may not have anybody still in that game. Uh, Barnes definitely won't be playing. I, given kind of like what RJ and Quick are going through. Um, I don't think they'll be playing. So you'd think they could win that one. Um, and then they play the Spurs after that, who, yeah, Wemby's great, but you still would think uh, the Knicks can can win that. But, like, they need him to get back on the floor, man. Like, I don't know what else to say. Like, I, I get that he's dealing with something, um, but – all these guys are, you know, um, Brunson has definitely, he's definitely playing banged up. You know, he's always got this fucking tape on his right yeah. hand. I don't know. He's always got that. Tape he always down. has a black eye on his eye. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he's obviously been beat up this season. Josh Hart. Um, he's been dealing with like some chronic knee thing since fucking January, which he said before he was playing like, 48 minutes yeah. consistently so, like he and i'm sure Don, dante we know he he tweaked like his hamstring or something prior to the all-star break obviously the all-star break came at a very good time um he seems fine but like i'm sure he's dealing with shit like everybody's dealing hard with to sign i don't think he's fully recovered from the achilles yet yeah, he's, he's still on he's minutes still, restriction yeah, he's precious still. is on some kind of minutes restriction i think yeah i just so i, I don't know like i i get it i get that you he needs to get back to full strength and whatever, but like, look, I, I'm not encouraging guys to like play through injuries that potentially, you know, you can risk your future health through it. But like, I also think sometimes guys need to be good teammates um, and, and suck it up and sacrifice for the betterment of the team. And like, I don't know. I, I just, it's kind of disappointing. I'm not going to lie. Like I, I'm kind of disappointed in, this like he's already been ruled out tonight for tonight's game also so now we're talking about four games in a row that he's missed post surgery after he missed like he's basically been out for two months at this point and you know the surgery part of it is unavoidable right like it, it had to happen fine this the flare up thing i don't know again i don't know so i feel bad even speculating and having an opinion on it but i can't I can't like deny that as a fan and, and of, of this team. And I want to see them obviously get an advantageous seating and all this stuff. Like it is disappointing. You know, it, it is flat out. Like, um, I, I don't know what else to say. And, and look, he, he's also up for a contract this summer. Like, I'm sorry if I'm the Knicks, that's not some like automatic. All right. 40 million a year. Like, no, like, they're going to have to have a serious conversation with him because this is ridiculous, honestly. He's fucking played a month of basketball for us. And in that month, I mean, they're 15-2 or 16-2, whatever the fuck they are with him in the lineup. 
They're basically the best team in basketball when he plays. And then, but like, it's like the fucking Garnett meme, right? Why would you show me if you can't, if you won't let me have it, right? Or whatever the fucking line is. But like, it's like, what it feels like. I'm like, what the fuck, man? Like, you're going to get back on the floor here or what? What are we doing here? Um, and, you know, it just, it's frustrating because it, it just feels like everybody else on this team is gutting it out through something. And then guys like Randall and Mitch, like, who are also out with injury, you just feel it's like, that's like, it makes more sense why they've been out as long as they've been out. And Mitch seems like, I mean, Mitch is probably going to come back before OG does. So yeah, that's just, I don't know. To me, it's just really, really frustrating. Yeah. I mean, I think in terms of contract negotiations, um, the playoffs are going to matter a lot. I, I, I promise you if the Knicks make a run to the Eastern conference finals. Well, yeah, of course. Um, this is going to be forgotten. Uh, especially because they won't make one without OG. I think that's pretty realistic, um, unless they just... I mean, you could see it. I don't think Cleveland's going to fall to the... Uh, you could see it maybe if they get the three seed, maybe they can beat um, Indiana or someone without OG, although that'll still be tough because um, you don't really have a good answer for Siakam, and Randall will be back, back banged up even if he's back. Um, but can they beat Milwaukee without OG? That's really tough. Um, and so if they make a run, it'll be because OG came back. And at that point, um, you have to think that they'd be willing to pay him whatever. Um, but it is concerning. I, I, you know, I do think this is a little bit of an unusual injury. You know, it's not like it's a, it's a bone spur. He had surgery. Um, it definitely didn't look like he could shoot properly. Um, and I think at least in part, um, you know, the road trip, that was surprising because those are games they needed to win. Uh, and that, that's, that's, those are games they ostensibly needed him to win. Um, it's a credit to them that, um, it's a credit to them that they, they didn't have against the Kings, right? They didn't have against the Kings. That was a big game to win without him. No, he played uh, against the Kings. He played he against was, the Kings. He was awesome defensively in that game too. Like, I, like, this is my point. Like, I get the fucking shoulder is fucked up, right? I get that. Like, or the shoulder, not the shoulder, the elbow. Um, I get it. Like, I get it. Feels weird. I get it. Whatever. It's like, a weird I, injury. It's the bone. I, I, I and I and I get that. But like, dude, Josh Hart can't make a fucking shot right now, right? Like, he's still out there playing. If OG can't shoot, fine. He can still do shit. He can play 50 minutes a game and help this team right now. Well, the promise of a version of OG that can shoot after in the playoffs. I mean, you said yourself, right? Like, as long as they avoid the play in. This team can beat anyone. You said you don't care about their first round matchup, so I, I don't care about it. But I, but I, I think like back at full strength, if we, if we, if the choice is you can get OG back now and it's like never going to be good this season, or you rest OG now during some winnable games, and he can shoot eventually when he comes back. What, you know, that's I'm using when for what feels scarily like if, but that trade-off could be worth it, right? Because then you get the full OG experience, and we would like him to shoot, right? <laughs> Especially if we play a team like Boston. Yeah. Or, um, so, I mean, so he didn't play against Sac... What was the next... So between Sacramento and Denver was what? Uh, that's it. Sacramento, then we... Or no, Golden State. Yeah, so they beat Golden State without him. Um, obviously, very good offensive team. Um, and And then even against Denver, I thought they played... Like they they led that game for uh, pretty much the entire first half, uh, and you know they didn't really go away. And that's a team that should be blowing them out if they don't have OG. Um, but they proved that that's not really the case. So I think the calculus they're making is, and I don't think this is just an OG decision. Although I'm sure, like with this contract coming up, he is worried about just looking like shit in the playoffs. Um, but I think the what they're probably looking at is if we get a version of OG back that shoots. And we can just hold down the fort for now with a somewhat promising schedule. Um, you know, we'll we'd rather make that bet than. But I, I do hear you in, in the locker room. You know, this is a very veteran group. I don't think these kind of things are going to be a huge issue. But if you're Josh Hart, if you're Jalen Brunson, you're looking over like, hey man, what's up? You know, I'm out here killing myself for 48 minutes. You got Deuce playing 48 minutes a night, and you look over, and you know the guy can play. It isn't great, but locker room morale, I think, is is pretty high for the Knicks. Um, 
personally, I can see why fans are frustrated. And I think also the uncertainty. It's like, okay, but is he even going to come back after these four games? That's like not a thing they've said. My belief is they're just being cautious because there's winnable games right now. Even if they fall down to like the sixth seed, I don't think they're super concerned about that. And it would be much worse if even if they get a high seed, if they if OG just never really recovers and just can't shoot. Yeah, I mean, look, I hear all that. I just, I, I kind of think it's bullshit. Like, I, I would be annoyed if I was. I'm honestly, if I'm on the team right now, if I'm fucking Josh Hart, I'm annoyed. I just how I'd feel about it. I, I don't know. Maybe, and maybe, maybe that's wrong because maybe the guys in the team understand what's going on more. I mean, they do understand. What's it's going worth on. noting Josh Hart plays a ton of minutes no matter what. So, like, even if OG came back, he'd be playing forty. Might not be playing forty eight, but I think there are obviously games where Hart's giving you nothing offensively and i mean like we saw it the end of that road trip the denver game he josh like that he played for 40 he played like 40 fucking minutes in that game i think he had like two points two rebounds two assists or some shit like that like he had nothing he had no juice in that game he had no energy you could visibly see it um i don't know i i again like if i'm on the team obviously those guys would they they, they know more Right, they they obviously know what's going on much, <laughs> much better than we do. I just, I I can't. I'm just being honest about how I feel. I'm not even saying it's a right or it's justified or whatever, but, um, I just think it's frustrating. And like, I mean, I, what happened to Gary Cooper? You know? Yeah, exactly. He what would he would have played through a, a bone spur in his elbow. You know? I just, but it's it's not like the MRI is fucking. It came back clean. That's what Tib said. So to me. What you're really talking about there is that, like, OG himself is saying, like, I, it doesn't feel right. It's not comfortable. And 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 to your point and to the point that, um, you know, erring on the side of caution, like, just because an MRI comes back clean and just because the medical staff and whatever is saying, hey, no, it's all everything is good structurally, doesn't always mean that. Uh, the player is wrong that that he's being a coward or something, right? Like we know Markel Fultz, and hopefully, God, please, God, don't let us be some Markel Fultz situation. But like Fultz, like he he got MRI, MRI's back clean constantly for a year until he was properly diagnosed with what the hell he had, um, which was whatever the fuck it was, something in his shoulder. Um, so like it's not a guarantee of anything. It just, but it is frustrating, um, just because you see how much everybody else in the team is giving up right now, you know? And, and, and also because I feel like you feel confident in the fact that if Randall had the same situation as OG, you, I mean, is there any doubt in your mind he'd be playing through this shit? No. Through anything? I mean, he played through, I mean, he played through the playoffs last year. I don't, I don't think OG. If OG sits out the playoffs, he is costing himself a lot of money. I think that that that, that is just a fact. But um, I think Randall's pain tolerance, um, maybe even sometimes to the team's detriment, um, has never been questioned. That guy's a fucking warrior. Yeah, and and that's 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 where it's frustrating for me. Cause I'm just like I just feel like this is an OG thing. Um. And yeah, look, it's it's it it becomes more frustrating because we did see what this team is like without or with him rather, and they're fucking awesome. And you're like, can we can we get that? Can we like can we can that guy come back? Because with him, you know, I think the Knicks can beat anybody in the East, really. Um, I think they, they beat lost. Denver. They could beat Denver. They nearly beat them without him. Like that game. I mean, they lost by what thirteen, but they were in that game this whole second half. Like. Um, and they yeah, without like 38, Hart, whatever the fuck it was, without with yeah, him, so. and maybe we didn't get the be Nuggets' best shot, but I don't think that's. I mean, when Jokic is on, it's a difference maker. That is, I mean, we saw that in that game, but we also saw that, like, you talked about Hart's offense on defense, he was a step, step slow too. And the Knicks are executing some pretty complex stuff against Jokic, which is what has worked the last the two games before that. But you know, you're you're a half second too slow. And Jokic is going to burn you, right? You have the execution has to be perfect, which it, it wasn't quite that. Um, you know, so I think with OG, but do you think, let me ask you this there is still uncertainty about whether Randall can come back. 
do you think if it turns out Randall can't come back, they would say there would be less of a push for OG to come back just because they're probably not going to go to the East, Eastern Conference Finals at that point anyway without Randall? I mean, do you think they could beat Milwaukee without Randall? Um, if they have OG? Look, probably not, but this is this is why it's so frustrating to to hit, for him to have not played any of these fucking games without Randall because we don't know what this team is in that scenario. You know, like we don't know. We don't know because we haven't fucking seen it. Um, and that was kind of like, you know, but we saw I mean, he played with Randall a good amount, right? No, no, no. I'm not talking I'm talking about without Randall. Like this yeah. stretch where Randall's been out. Obviously, look, the, the surgery's unavoidable for OG, but he comes back and you're like, okay, now we're going to get a real sample of like what this team looks like when he's healthy. You play him and Hart at the three and the four. And like, what, what does that all look like? How, how good can this team be in those scenarios? I mean, and all we got, I mean, it's good, but like we got them smoking Philly. We got them smoking the Blazers. And then we got them winning a pretty epic game against the Kings where they held them to 91 points, by the way, you know, and like they controlled it pretty much wire right. to wire. So yeah, they controlled the game, the pace, of the game and all that shit. And that's, but that's all we got. We didn't like, and, and so like to answer your question, like, no, probably they probably cannot beat the, the bucks without OG, but like, or sorry, without Randall. But I also don't feel confident answering that question because I don't fucking know what the team in the, we have OG, but not Randall scenario truly looks like and it's you know like i get it people would probably be like well were you really gonna learn that because he just by playing golden state and fucking denver and and the and the nets and now the pistons like no but the larger sample gives you a better idea and uh now we don't have that and in the meantime we're just i don't know I, maybe this is like kind of selfish too but like it's just like, dude, without OG and Randall, like I, I kind of feel like I, I don't know that I can provide any new analysis of this team, or or have an insight into this team that somebody else or whoever like has not stayed. Like we've seen it now for so long that I'm just like, I, I kind of get what this is, you know, um, and it's just about gutting out wins. Like I. You, you almost don't care how it gets done. You know what I mean? You're just trying to gut out wins. I it, And, you know, maybe to... It's been way too depressing of a conversation, but, like, maybe to switch to a more up uh, a more optimistic uh, topic. But, like, the one thing we can say is with OG out, um, it has given opportunities to a lot of players. And one of those players uh, is Deuce McBride. And Deuce McBride has grabbed this opportunity and ran with it and is playing the best basketball of his career. Um, and I'll just say this, like, I, I'm pretty uninterested in the comparisons of him and Emmanuel quickly. Like, I, I just don't think it's a worthwhile discussion. And, uh, what's the, what is it? Comparison is the thief of joy or whatever the fuck that, uh, that saying is, but like, it's just, I don't find that conversation very useful. And I, I just don't think it's, it, it matters because like we we don't have quickly any anymore and we do have deuce and deuce is awesome. Deuce is playing great and he deserves a ton of credit for how he's playing. Um, and I think Tibbs deserves a ton of credit for how he's brought him along, kept him kind of, uh, I mean, deuce deserves the majority of the credit here, but like, I think Tibbs deserves credit for how he's brought him along and just keeping him kind of prepared and ready to go whenever he's been called upon. And now he's been called upon in the starting lineup. And obviously since the uh, trade for OG were quickly in RJ go out, he's been in the rotation. So um, shout out to him and, and, and Tibbs and the coaching staff for keeping him prepared as well. Yeah. I mean, um, I think this, this year is probably Tibbs' best coaching job, um, at least in New York. Um, yeah. You know, dealing with all the injuries, dealing with a ton of roster turnover. Um, I think someone tweeted, I don't know if it was Tommy Beer, um, whoever tweeted it, but if you look at the Knicks rotation going into the season, it was Brunson. So starting point guard Brunson, uh, still here. Grimes, gone. Um, the three was RJ, gone. Power forward, injured. Uh, starting center, or power forward, Randall, injured. 
center Mitch injured, right? So four of your five starters are either injured or no longer on the team. Um, you know, and, uh, and, and then if you look at your six man, that was quickly, he's gone. Right. Uh, now you can say they got, obviously they go for free. Um, but you can see dealing with that level of turnover to manage that as seamlessly as he has. And part of that is just how good, uh, OG has been, but I think he's really pushed the right buttons. Um, I think, you know, I, I think that, you know, of the criticisms, what, what are really the, the criticisms that we had earlier this year? Yeah. You would have wanted more Grimes instead of Hart on some of the poor spaced lineups with RJ. <coughs> um, but, you know, Grimes also was part of the problem there. And um, and he went to DiVincenzo and he started to trust him more. And then they made the trade. That worked out really well. Uh, adapted to injuries. Um, we we were all very worried, right, that he was just going to over-rely on Alec Burks, right? We, we, we know two years ago he kind of did. And that was the big worry. And he adapted reasonably quickly to the fact that Burks doesn't really have it anymore. So, um, you know, I pulled my own Marco, Marco Rubio there. Um, you know, he <coughs> he's pushed the right buttons, and now with Deuce, <coughs> 48 minutes probably isn't sustainable all the time. Um, but Deuce has just been excellent, and Tibbs has shown trust in him. He's given him some offensive freedom too, right? Deuce isn't just a catch-and-shoot guy. Um, I still, you know... I think Kenny run bench offense as the primary creator. I don't know, but I've seen him improve in terms of his aggressiveness and picking his spots, getting to the rim. Um, you know, he's a guy, and this has been his MO since his rookie year. He doesn't really turn the ball over. Um, so for all the kind of concerns about space creation and all of that, he's a pretty reliable ball handler. I, I love that how he looks next to Brunson. I think Tibbs going three small guards. I really hope even at full health, he continues to go to that because Brunson – like McBride can guard up, DiVincenzo is a solid defender, and even Brunson's been playing really well on defense this year. I mean, he's been playing bigger than his size, right? I, I, I still think in the playoffs there's going to be teams that can pick on him a little bit, but um, I would so I'd say Deuce has been excellent. Look, I've, I've believed in the shot even when the percentages weren't great. I really thought he needed the reps. Um, I think even a guy like you know, Obi Toppin was shooting better this year when he actually was able to get into a rhythm. I think that's a thing. Now I'm not saying that you deserve reps just for that, but I'm saying just pointing at the percentage and saying this guy can't shoot can be a little bit reductive. Uh, and I think Deuce seems to fit that the ethos of this team where he's a gym rat, you know, came up under Bob Huggins. I think that's a good question to ask him. How would he compare Huggins and Thibodeau as coaches? Well, um, hopefully uh, it doesn't well, not compare them at all. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I yeah. That's a good point. Uh, definitely not off the court <laughs> or belief systems or whatever. But um, but in, in terms of they both have reputations as very defensive oriented coaches, hard asses, if you will. Um, but um, you know McBride, he fits the, that mo of the team. Just a gym rat, um, gets the most out of his ability, and um, and credit Tibbs this year for honestly, like yeah, I think he's done a better job coaching this year than maybe even the coach of the year season. Like if they get the three seed, I would. I don't think he'll win it. It'll probably go to like Missoula, but um, but he's been as good as any coach in the league this year. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I agree with you. I think he this has been his best coaching job um, in New York, or honestly, probably his entire career as a head coach. Here he lost Rose was pretty good, and he went to know at point center. That's the one that came to mind, and they beat the Nets despite being shorthanded. I think yeah, I, I would still I still think this is better because I think this conference is better. I think the league is better. Um, and for the Knicks, I mean, they've actually like so. I think when OG went out, uh, OG and Randall went out. I think the Knicks were twenty nine and seventeen. Um, so for them to have actually gone a couple of more games above 500 in this stretch without them uh speaks to the job he's doing as a head coach um and i think that west coast trip i mean he he was awesome during that you know that golden state win stands out it's one of the best wins of the season in a lot of ways i thought the kings won the kings win was spectacular also but like he's just pushing a lot of the right buttons and um yeah he he's He's just done a really, really good job. Uh, and as far as Deuce, like, I, I got to say, um, you know, I don't 
again, I, I, I don't want to compare to these two guys at all because uh, I just think it's stupid. Um, but like if you're viewing it as Tibbs, I think Tibbs probably trusts a, more in the Brunson-Deuce combination in the backcourt than he ever would with Quick. Um, purely because I think what made Quickly so good in New York defensively is how maniacal and and consistent he was at making the help rotations um, that are required of like help defenders in Tibbs's rotation. Um, but when he played with Brunson, um, obviously, look, we don't need to debate this again. Like, I just always will believe that like those two were really fun. I mean, they were really fucking good together, and I would just roll the dice and play them a lot more than Tibbs did. But I think his concern was always like, all right, well, if I'm going to hide Brunson somewhere, then I have to put quick, probably a point of attack. And I don't really love him as a point of attack defender. So, you know what? But with Deuce, he doesn't have that that issue because Deuce is a phenomenal point of attack defender. He's maybe one of the best in the league anyways. Um, certainly one of the best. I mean, outside of OG, he's probably the best. He is the best on the team outside of OG. And honestly, maybe even including OG, um, Deuce is a better pure point of attack defender. But like that comfort that he has and trust that he has in Deuce, I think makes him more open and willing to play this. I mean, look, the Knicks are playing a super fucking small lineup right now. <laughs> Brunson, Deuce, DiVincenzo, Hart, uh, that's her one to four. Like that's pretty fucking tiny. And I think it's that is like one of those old Jay Wright Villanova teams, right? Yeah. <laughs> like they used to play four guards all the time. Yeah. And I just think it's like, um, it's just really, it says, it says a lot about honestly how he, his trust in Deuce now to this point. And like, you know, I joked a lot when Deuce first got put in the rotation where, you know, Every game we'd have to hear about like, oh my God, we talked to Tibbs last night and he told us how much he loves Deuce McBride. And it's like, all right, well, he loves him so much that he's playing him 11 minutes tonight. Like, I don't, I don't really get it, but um, he's earned more minutes from him. He's earned more trust from him. He's earned a bigger role now. And, um, and did you see his brother posted Trey McBride was like, yeah. uh, you know, you go, you go from playing not at all. To- Playing no minutes to all the minutes. That's the tips. I don't think he meant it as a shot at tips. No, I think he was joking. He's just joking around. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 it says a lot about why like he just trusts Deuce, and I think he believes in that skill set next to Brunson. And he he thinks that skill set next to Brunson is more tenable. And then also, and he mentioned this, and he's right uh, after the game against the Nets. But like, Deuce is pretty much a guy that you cannot you can't play off of. Like if he's off the ball you got to be aware of where he's at because right now he is a fucking sniper. Very quick um, release, high release too. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, no, I totally agree. It's real gravity. We'll see how it, if it plays out, how it plays on the playoffs. But um, in the regular season, he's, he's a real sniper. Yeah. And he had a, he, he had a couple of really nice finishes against the nets too. He had one in transition um, that he took all the way to the rim. And then he had one where he missed the three, got the offensive rebound and then was able to go all the way to the rim. He actually kind of duped uh, Nick Claxton at the rim. He like went up looking like he was going to go up with his right, and then he actually finished with his left. Um, Jordan S, if you will. Yeah, I was about to say the same thing. Um, but yeah, like he he's just playing really really good, and um, I do think that his the that that one thing that point of attack defense is something that I think Tibbs will I, – I just think he trusts that so much that – or he values it so much that he has more faith in, um, you know, Brunson and Deuce being a, su- like, sustainable uh, backcourt together in a way that I don't know – that I don't think he ever truly bought in uh, with Quick and Brunson. Yeah, and I mean, it's – um you know, I still think, and, and I think the other part of it also is, you know, with Grimes, it was kind of the other part of that equation, right? Where Grimes is a really good point of attack defender, not as great 
probably has a guy like Hart on, or, or certainly quickly on rotations, right? On the off ball stuff, right? Deuce gives you both. OG gives you both. And I think that's really the big difference where everyone's talking about just kind of size, but Deuce is also, I think you used the word cerebral. Um, he's a very, he's, he's, you know, he's maybe not quite quickly off ball, but he, he, you rarely see him miss a rotation. He has a tad of, he can be a tad handsy at times. That's probably the one criticism I'd have on Deuce. But, but, but that's, 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 that's what makes him, that's what yeah. makes him like what he but is. He, he gets ca caught sometimes with his hand in the cookie jar, which I, I, again, for like a third year player to be this advanced on defense. And we've seen it before. I mean, I, I could talk about those five minutes he had against Donovan Mitchell forever. Like, that was just insane. Like, um, I, I kind of had hoped after that he would get more minutes um, in the playoffs. Uh, he certainly will get them this year. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I also think it's worth noting, like, you know, Grimes, I think some of the sidestep threes and, like, or if he got closed out on, you know, Courtney Lee always had this thing where he never took a sidestep three. He would step in, right? He would step in and take a long two. With Deuce, he seems to be very comfortable with the sidestep, you know, uh, and relocation. So even on a good closeout, it's you haven't done your job. He can get it off off balance. He hits a ton of late shot clock shots. And I'll say this: the biggest difference between him and Grimes, uh, and even well, quickly have the floater, but that pull up mid range for for McBride has become really reliable. And so even when he can't get all the way to the rim and they play drop, he's very comfortable pulling up. He has a high release in the mid range. Um. And, um, you know, the, I think on offense, what you'd like to see him do, um, he's been better getting the rim, but he's always going to, he's never, he's not the quickest guy with the ball in his hands. I think the next step I think will, especially with that mid range game, can he start to develop a little bit of that Brunson post game, right? Use your body, right? If you look at how physical Brunson is, and if you look at how big McBride is and the fact that he has a mid range game, that's kind of, and that's, <clears throat> that's definitely a next season and seasons to come thing. Uh, if you look how far Deuce has come, I wouldn't bet against it. But that could really, I think, make him an even more devastating score and maybe potentially a guy who can really be a full-time starting point guard. Uh, but even if he never becomes that, he's a very valuable guy. I mean, you'd have to put him like – he's like our D'Anthony Melton in many ways, right? Yeah. And uh, and that's a, a very valuable player. <clears throat> um I, at one point, I was like, you know, his floor is kind of like a Javon Carter type. Javon Carter is a very valuable player. You know, Beverly stayed in the league for a long time, and I think Deuce is already better than. Is it crazy to say Deuce is better than Pat Beverly ever was? Um, I'm not gonna lie. I have no, like, my thoughts on peak Pat Beverly are that I don't really give a fuck. Um. But yeah, I mean, if you want to say he's better than Pat Bev ever was, I'm I'm cool with that because fuck Pat Bev. Yeah, and I, I think Pat Bev. There's this is like the fact that Deuce is good at on ball and off ball defense matters because I do think pure point of attack guys who can't rotate well or aren't great on closeouts or don't crash the glass they do get overrated because there's a lot more to defense than one on one defense and. Um, you know, I do think there's a lot, like, I think Grimes, when it's even last year, was a little bit overrated on defense because he wasn't that great as an off-ball player. Deuce can do both. OG can do both. And I think that's a very important distinction. And he gives you more on offense, I think, than Pat Bev did. Than most guys, I mean, the kind of guys who are better than Deuce on offense and defense, you're talking about, like, Drew Holiday. And, and Drew Holiday might not be better than him on defense right now. But, like, you're talking about all-star level players and... I don't know. Maybe Deuce has a chance to be that good. Um, he might. Uh, he he's just he's playing really really well, and he's found a niche. And you know, you talked about you just mentioned I think a little bit as in jest, but um, kind of like oh, it's like these those Villanova teams with Jay Wright, but like I think it's. It, it almost it feels like Deuce is like a Villanova guy or something now. Like, I don't know. The way he kind of fits in with those other three, obviously Brunson, DiVincenzo, and Hart, he's kind of found his niche. Um, I think they're also now trusting him more. Um, like, you saw Brunson and Hart 
kind of find him with extra passes against the Nets. Um, and he's also now willing to take threes that are more tightly contested. You know, they're not just wide open threes that he's getting. He's he's getting real contested and he's willing to take those shots. So like he's continues to progress as a player as well, given given the time he's had now uh, on the floor. And I think with this group, with this team, with this rotation, he's getting a higher level of comfort and he's also just slotting in kind of like it's probably it, it's probably feels really comfortable for Brunson and even Chenzo and Hart because they're like, oh yeah, like we this is what we did. Like this is what this is how we played. So we're we're good with this. And he's kind of fitting into exactly all that that play style and stuff. And honestly, I mean he's he's playing great. Uh he he was a big reason the Knicks were they they kept the game kind of close in that first quarter. There was points where the Nets looked like maybe they'd pull away a little bit. Uh he just kept making big shots. And then you know, he continued to just play at a high level throughout the game. He played the entire fucking game, right? Yep. So, like, that if if there's not, and I, I you know, like, and he was seen, guarding the the great Cam Thomas. God, that guy is terrible. Um, that entire team is terrible. Um, but like, to to keep it you know, on deuce for a little bit here, like he. You know, uh, we've seen Tibbs do this with various players, right? Where he just dials up their minutes um, when he has an injury. But, like, I think for him to have gone from very, like, basically not in the rotation situational to, okay, now you're in the rotation because we need a backup point guard and we traded ours and whatever, but I don't really trust you to this. I mean, it says a lot about his progression as a player and also Tibbs' trust in him. And I'll say this um, as a kind of credit to Tibbs and just a thought on development in general. Like, I think me, myself, uh, you, others have been critical of how Tibbs hands out minutes to young players at times, younger players at times. But I think there is something to be said about he's not going to put guys on the floor unless he trusts them to do a job and he trusts them to help him and help the team win basketball games. And because of that, it's hard for young players to earn their keep with him, but you do have to earn your keep. And I think there's a value to understanding that for young players and I think there's a, that's why these guys, like, you know, when we see Quick for as long as we did, we see Mitchell Robinson, we see, you know, all these various younger players on this team that have come through, but we see how impactful they are in a positive way. Um, and I think when you have to earn your minutes, right, when you really have to earn them, it's not like, this is not like, this is not a guy who's going to be like, oh, well, you know, Deuce is in his second year. He could just use these reps because he needs development. Like that's just not never how he's going to operate, which is its own way of, you know, how he views development. Um, I think there's a real value to that. And honestly, you know, you, you talk about, I, I think that's something that Houston, the Rockets are benefiting from this year with Ime Udoka, who I think is cut from the same cloth in terms of, He's not just going to be like, well, oh, Jalen Green is young, so I'm going to give him all the minutes. Like, yeah, he played Jalen Green a lot, but he was closing games without Jalen Green at various points, you know. And we'll see if Jalen Green Jalen Green has stepped it up. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, and we'll see. We'll see if he keeps it up. But that's yeah, that's where I was going with it. Is like now we're seeing Jalen Green take this step in his career. He's playing actually like really well. Post All Star break, he's been really good, and not just like oh, he's putting up numbers good, but like no, he's like actually helping the team win. I think he's like the highest, one of the highest plus minuses in the yeah, league. Yeah, he does. He does. I think it's second or something. I think it's like Hartenstein was one and uh, Jalen Green is two. It's like plus minus, aggregate, like basically aggregate plus minus, raw plus minus uh, post all-star break. But like, I think there's real value to that. And, um, you know, not, and, and that's not to say that there's not an argument for development in terms of like, eh, we just give the young guys, I'm not like, I, I think you can argue it both ways, but 
personally, I feel strong, more strongly about how Tibbs approaches development. And I kind of am at the point where like, I, I think he, you just have to give him the benefit of the doubt in, in terms of like, there's just been so much improvement of players in their time in New York and very specifically young players, right? We've seen almost every player this team has drafted improve under Tom Thibodeau. Um, so at some point you just have to give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I think I, people are saying we're not going to give development minutes. I think that second year was the most frustrating one, right? Because the Knicks weren't winning either. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think for me, it's always, it's generally been, I'm okay with that. If you say I'm going to play the best lineups, that's a good consistent methodology to have, right? Unless the team is actively tanking and we've seen that can cause cultural issues. So that's fine. Um, I think my thing was always there were times when he would play veteran players and it would hurt the Knicks' chances of winning, right? I think that has happened, right? So, um, for example, if quickly hadn't earned your trust, did Alfred Payton earn your trust to do his job? Maybe there were certain things and quickly did have some shortcomings on defense. Um, You know, so I think that that was always the thing. But I think what's been unquestionable is the the player development. I don't think you could ever say – Tibbs hurts the development of players. Uh, I think the opposite is very largely true. Part of it might be the fact, to your point, that they do have to, they are on a steeper curve, right? It's harder on them than it is on vets even. They don't get the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and they really have to fight and claw that much harder. Uh, part of it could be... Claw with a fingernail to that inch. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, part of it could be, um, you know, part of it, I think they do have a good development staff and, and it is their credit for that. Part of it could be Tibbs just very attention to detail. And I'll also say this. I do think Tibbs has evolved. You're the quarterback, kid. You know what that means? That's the top job. <laughs> You're not some flash-in-the-pan quarterback of Julian Washington. You're a goddamn quarterback, which Deuce is, by the way. Um, Deuce is Willie Beeman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's like the least yeah, Willie we've Beeman. Seen the, we've seen the Jimmy Fox dance moves, right? So... Um, no, I, I think that there's Metrics. also tricks in flex your chest. <laughs> <laughs> there, I think he's evolved too. Like, he moved off. I also, Willie again, Beeman, off, <laughs> Willie Beeman has evolved into many things. Um, I learned more watching him play one half of football than I had my entire career. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you're doing the Pacino voice for Jamie Foxx. <laughs> Um, but, um, yeah, Tibbs was, um, yeah, he's moved off vets this year. He's trusted. And I think, and you talk about, you know, I think DiVincenzo gave extensive quotes. Was it Sam Emick who had this article on Tibbs? Yeah. And he gave extensive quotes. Like you hear these, you know, urban legends or whatever about how Tibbs just runs his players on the ground in practice. Because that it's not really like that. There's a lot of off days. And, you know, it's efficient practices, right? So in two hours, we're there and we're locked in. Um, and I think that's probably, I think people have said Tibbs is just going to be Tibbs no matter what. And that's something I, I would say, no, I think he's capable of adapting. I think his core identity is always going to be the same, right? He's going to try to win every game. He's not going to buy into, like, you know, the minutes police stuff. Um, and, um, you know, and, and I've never really had a problem with that beyond, you know, games where they're like up down 20 points and then like you're leaving guys in with a minute that's the kind of thing where i'm like you know a little bit iffy but um i think he's shown that he can adapt um and i think he'd shown that in chicago too it's just it always seemed to only happen when his back was against the wall but now i think you're you're seeing him be more flexible even in in situations where he has some options and um it honestly gives me a little bit more confidence for the playoffs now in the playoffs if he turns back to you know, I'm never going to play Deuce next to DiVincenzo and Brunson, those kind of things. But there's going to be trade-offs, right? We're going to play bigger teams. Um, but it's, it's, it is, that's just, and they could put, I mean, with Deuce, he, Deuce and OG together next to like Hart and, you know, Precious and Hartenstein mm-hmm. or something like that, or even Randall, like they can put some brutal defensive lineups out there, like that are just fucking hell to play with. Imagine do, go, if you run a pick, on deuce and then oh og pops up right and then you try to make a pass and hearts in the passing lane uh or or devo uh and then you got to deal with hartenstein if you get through all of that at the rim it can they can put some just insane defensive lineups out there and that's why it's to your point that much more frustrating that we can't see it with og right now 
yeah. Um, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what they do. I, I, but I agree with you. Like, I think that if Tibbs continues to lean into the type of flexibility he's shown this season, um, then the Knicks are going to be they're, they're, like it, it's they, so we've talked about this a, a ton going back to like the start of the season, even before we made the trades. And obviously now since the trades, like the team's versatility is probably their greatest strength. Um, and Tibbs is not a coach that's renowned for leaning into that, being flexible and all this type of stuff. But I think he's shown a lot of flexibility this season. And it's that, that's why I think this is his best coaching job because it's it gives me the most optimism going into the playoffs that I've ever had in him. His willingness to like adapt is impressive. And you know, look, he for the majority of this stretch, right, where we didn't have OG and Randall, he started precious with the four. And I was always okay with that because I'm like, look, none of these lineups are that great. And honestly, Deuce wasn't playing as well as he has been. Like, so, so to me, it was like, okay, well, all these lineups have some fatal flaw. It is what it is. He's trying to make the best of a bad situation. If his view is like, you know, if it, if if from his point of view, the Jedi are evil. No, um, no. If if he if he thinks if he if he was just like, all right, well. Let's just try to win the possession battle and and try and out out shoot teams in terms of having more shot attempts. Um, fine, so be it. Like, and that's what it was, right? Obviously, it wasn't beautiful to watch. It wasn't great. It wasn't, but ended up it was okay. The Knicks were treading water. Um, but he said this, like, you know, who knows if he would have he wouldn't have started Deuce, obviously, if. OG hadn't gotten hurt and, and went back out. But like he referenced this after the, the Golden State game where he was like, look, like the last matchup, you know, when we started precious or whatever, like the game got away from us to start that like to start, right? I mean, it was basically the reverse of the game that happened uh in Golden State, where it was like the Knicks were wire to wire wins after they got out, or, or the Knicks had a wire to wire win when they got out to a big early lead, and like that's what happened at the garden, right? They got it, the Warriors got into a big early lead, and they were playing from behind. They couldn't quite dig out of the hole. Um, but their best minutes in that game were with Deuce and on the floor with like DiVincenzo and Hart and Brunson. And he was like, Look, uh, you know, we wanted to get he referenced that, and then he was like, you know, we wanted to spread the floor out and all this type of stuff. And like, and then after this last game against Brooklyn. He was asked about why Jericho Sims played as the backup big in the second half and Precious actually didn't play in the second half. And he specifically said, like, you know, uh, it was more of like a size thing and Claxton and Dayron Sharp, they're bigger dudes. So we just wanted to kind of match that physicality. And so I went with Sims. And, like, look, Sims, obviously, he's what he is. Um, but, like, I, I think – that willingness to kind of adjust to the opponent in game him talking about that. So transparently um, that's really, really encouraging going into the playoffs because that was a, like, that was a primary frustration throughout that heat series, right? Where you're like, dude, you're not trying anything. You're just, you're not trying anything. You're just doing the same shit over and over and over and over and over. Um, and we'll see if he ever does it. I, I still tend to believe that like, for him, the one thing he just can't move off of is got to have like what he perceives as a true rim protector at the five. Um, but and that Sims all... isn't that. I mean, no, I, I know, I know, I know, I, I know he's not. I'm talking about how Tibbs perceives him. He, like, he might, I agree. I'm sure he, he obviously knows Sims isn't some great rim protector, but in his, like, the way he views Jericho Sims, he's like, okay, but he is a rim protector, he does do that whether he does it well or not. Um, but, like, we'll see. But to your point about, like, what Deuce gives you if OG comes back and all this stuff, like, the Knicks, at various points, we've talked about, man, this stretch, this moment, this opponent 
would be a hell of a time to use Randall at the five. And the Knicks have not had personnel necessarily to make that viable in a way that Tibbs believes it's viable. Now that we have seen what Deuce can do, and obviously we've seen the impact OG has when he's healthy, if you're playing certain matchups, like you're playing the Celtics, you're playing the Heat, whatever it is, where it's possible, like it would be interesting to see if you'd consider it. Because I think for the first time ever, yeah, obviously Randall's not a great rim protector or a good one or even a passable one. <laughs> um, but like you can put him in lineups where potentially, right? It could be a lineup of like Deuce, DiVincenzo, Hart, OG, Randall. Or Brunson, Deuce, Hart, OG, Randall. Like you can basically put him in lineups at the five where you're putting such elite perimeter defense around him that he's protected in a way that it could be fine. I, I think it would actually be more than fine defensively, but it's about how Tibbs perceives that. Would Tibbs believe that that lineup is capable, like would have the necessary defensive integrity as he sees it? I don't know. Um, but I do think truly, I don't think they're like, if, if, you're in a situation where your offense is stuck in the mud and you know, the, the centers just aren't making it happen for you in a positive way. There really isn't an excuse now for him to not be willing to try that. If the situation calls for it. Yeah. I mean, and part of that might be, um, I think if Mitch comes back healthy, I don't know that how often it will. Um, because I, I, we, it is worth talking about. Hardenstein has been really good on offense. Um, you know, it's probably not the same as Randall, but he gives you that push shot, sets good screens, um, is a really good offensive rebounder, um, has the touch. He's a reliable free throw shooter now. Um, so Hardenstein being that good maybe makes that. But, you know, things might look different in the playoffs, even with Mitch. Uh, I think how they integrate Mitch and how Tibbs integrates Mitch is going to be very interesting. Um, and I think another wild card is, I mean, I'll, I'll pivoting a little bit on this, you had mentioned, you know, OG Randall Precious being a lineup you wanted to see a lot, which gives you a lot of the same benefits, right? Yeah. Precious is not a stretch five, but he's willing to take three and he can hit the occasional one, right? He's not going to have any real gravity, though. Um, Precious's play has been a little bit, has dropped off, right? He was playing really, really well. A uh, little bit more of a mixed bag of late. Uh, really struggled with Sabonis and with the Warriors pick and roll game. I didn't think he was particularly good against Brooklyn. Um, you know what? Um, you know, are you a little bit tempered with Precious? Do you think maybe the you know there's wear and tear or something going on? Um, and you know, do you think this kind of and combined with Deuce's emergence, you know, the, the Detroit guys really haven't shown enough. So maybe it's a moot point. But and I think we were both pretty gung ho on Precious being part of the rotation. Have you come off that a little bit given the recent stretch? Um. I am fine with Precious. Like, I, I'm not that worried about it. His play has dropped off a little bit recently. Um, he also, I think it's important to remember, he was playing like 42 minutes a night in the month of February. He was kind of insane. Um, I wonder if that's just kind of catching up to him a little bit. Um, but, again, this goes back to Tibbs. Like, honestly, I I don't really care. Like I was, my main concern, right. Was not that precious is better than Mitch. And therefore like when Mitch comes back, Oh my God, like we're going to be benching the, the word, the better player. Like, no, Mitch is unequivocally a better player than precious. What I was worried about was like, all right, well, will Tibbs use precious situationally in instances where it makes sense over, Having like you know, if a team is playing a a spread like a five out offense. We've seen Mitch struggle with that at times, right? Because um, his natural inclination, which makes sense, is to play drop, sink in, right, protect the rim. And when you're playing against say Boston or whatever, like that's going to get you burned because that means Porzingis is going to be launching open threes. Like it's just tough, um, and. 
I, I that was my concern. It was like, well, God, is he just going to play 48 minutes of centers no matter what? Because he has those guys now. And maybe he will. But, um, again, his willingness to be more flexible, more experimental, um, and, and more adaptable in-game with various players this season makes me completely fine with kind of where Precious is at currently and how he might be used in the future. Um, and that is mostly because now I feel like Tibbs is at least showing, hey, I'm willing to to adjust and adapt and whatever. And also, you know, you reference the Detroit guys. It says a lot that in in the time that um, you know OG and Randall have been out, and we've had those guys. That his evaluation, his determination has been, well, I don't care if they're more experienced. I don't care what they are or aren't. I'm playing Deuce more than them. Um, and I think that's a really big credit to Tibbs also. And it should be said they've made the decision reasonably easy. <laughs> yeah. By not, uh, by not playing well. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's even hitting open shots, at least for Burks, has been really tough. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the center position. Um, Hardenstein is an awesome. I thought he had one of his best games this season against um, Golden State. Um, you know, has had some really dominant performances, has been at the top of many advanced stats categories. Um, you know, and with Precious emerging, um, we've talked a little bit about this. I think you said Mitch maybe is expendable. They have the draft picks. Um, you know, is that kind of still where you're at in terms of what they might do this offseason? Do you think even – does Hardenstein's emergence make even – maybe an M- – I know you're not an Embiid fan, period, but um, – does that even affect maybe that decision making? Just how good Hardenstein's been. Um, I mean, it should, right? Like, I, I think it actually should kind of um, affect the decision making. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Hardenstein, I, does Hardenstein playing this well make you even less want to trade for Embiid? And do you think even fans of Embiid might say, well, we already have a really good center? Yes. Like, I didn't want to trade for Embiid to begin with. So, yeah, I mean, Hardenstein playing at this level definitely makes me less inclined to want to trade for Embiid than I already was. Um, and honestly, it just makes it imperative than if Gita. Because, look, when Mitch comes back this year, which hopefully is, I kind of feel like it'll probably be against OKC uh, on Sunday or whatever. We'll see. Um, But, uh, like, Hardenstein just playing at such a high level. um, When Mitch comes back, those backup minutes are going to be awesome. Like, you know, we're going from Precious and Jericho Sims, who've done an admirable job when called upon. Um, but Mitch is obviously a different level of player. That's going to be awesome to have. Um, is that sustainable past the season? Like, is Mitch really going to be cool coming off the bench? Would Hardenstein be cool coming off the bench after this? At, at this point, you know, like it's easy to buy into it this season for right now. You know, like with Mitch coming back, Mitch has kind of been open to the idea of coming off the bench. Considering he hasn't played in so long, it's probably the best way to ease him back on the floor anyways. Um, that's fine for this season. Is that something that's sustainable past the season, though? I don't know. Um, but, like, I think I saw enough personally, and I understand people are like, oh, it's a small sample. You can't, like, but I saw enough after the trade for OG with Hartenstein at center and with Randall and OG at the three and the four and all that, and just how that lineup was and how the rotations were, I saw enough that I think Harnstein is almost like the perfect center for this construct of the team. Now, if you're trading for Embiid, like it changes and, and, and I think it would necessitate. I, I personally, I don't think a Randall Embiid front court is viable. I just don't buy it. Um, I think they'll get in each other's way. I, I think they both want to operate in the same areas offensively. Um, but like Hartenstein fits like a glove and now he's starting to flash more like willingness to take floaters. He was taking Jokic off the balance a few times. He had a career eye in that game. I think he scored what 20 points. 
Um, that was the first 20 point game of his career, which is kind of funny. But like, has Mitch has Mitch ever had a 20 point game? Yeah, he has. That's why, like, someone he he definitely has because someone was like, um, I would I would have thought Hardenstein would have had more. Yeah, but anyway, you're seeing you're seeing him be willing and and maybe yeah, have career the green light. 23. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, but you're seeing now Hardenstein be more willing and maybe he has the green light to take more shots, carry more offensive responsibility, usage, whatever, however you want to put it. Um, but like, I don't know. He just fits so well with these guys. And, you know, we talked about Tibbs adaptability here a lot. Like we didn't even mention this, but the offense they're running, I mean, they're basically using Brunson, like Steph Curry or something like the amount he's playing off ball, running off screens and shit. Hartenstein is fundamental to that. Like he is a fundamental piece of that. Again, if you get Embiid, like, well, now you have the luxury of like, okay, we don't need to to just run Brunson off ball screens seven thousand times to try and get him free because we actually just have two awesome shot creators in Brunson and Embiid. Um, but I think there's a real value to to having that that option um, and that ability to play that way. Uh, and I just I don't know. I, I personally am. I'm pretty high. I, outside of like the non-star centers in the league, so MB, you know, um, Jokic. Bam, Jokic, uh, whoever, Nick Claxton, yeah, Nick Claxton. Um, but outside of those guys, like I think Karnstein might be the best one. Man, he might be the best center. Would you take him over star. Jared Allen? Yes. You take it over Ruby, Rudy. Ruby, <laughs> Rudy, Rudy Gobert. Uh, yeah, I would. No, Wemby's his own thing. So I would. Wemby, Wemby, Wemby. Can't, Wemby I would. I, I think I'll take Wemby over Hartenstein. Like, <laughs> He's know. a star. Um, yeah, no, I mean, Allen would have been Allen. I think most people before before the playoffs last season, at least, would have said he's the best non-star big, right? I mean, he had made an all-star. Um, and yeah, I don't think that's crazy at all. Um. I would take him over like Robert Williams. I'd take him over Aiton. Um, I'd take him over Miles Turner at this point. Uh, I mean, look at the results. Like you can't, and he's just he's and he gives you a lot on offense. That's that was re- that's really been eye opening to me. Um, that that floater, a little push shot thing. Like it, it, there was a stretch where it was like really ugly and not going in. Um, it's automatic now. Um, you know he he and he's got a good post up game. Um, you know from the standpoint of. His one dribble pull up, his two dribble pull up, um, <laughs> you know, finishing at the rim. Uh, he's got it all in the bag, um, and it's going to be a very interesting off season. I, my expectation is um, Mitch goes out. I don't know for what. Is it something like? I mean, are they going for a guy like Michael Mikhail Bridges? Um, does Cleveland blow it up and you go get Mitchell, um, which maybe causes its own issues with how well Deuce is playing? Although I, I don't, I think. To your to what we were discussing earlier, Mitchell has been so good this year that it might not matter at that point. Um, I don't know. It's going to be an interesting offseason. I think with all their draft picks and how deep this draft is at center, I would not be surprised if they take one as a developmental guy. Um, I think Sims has not really improved, so he may be on the clock as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, Prez loves Don Klingon. If you watched UConn yesterday, you could see just how insane that he is on defense. Um, it'll be it'll be an interesting offseason for sure. Um, but we got the playoffs to to look at look forward to before that. Um, so besides kind of getting healthy, and besides, I think you've mentioned getting healthy, obviously, and Tibbs' adjustments. What is like? Is there anything else you really want to see, or a question you have you want answered from this team before the playoffs? Um, what do you what do you mean exactly? Like well, what, I think what, that, yeah, is there, I mean, or, like, what's the biggest question you have? Like, obviously, health is the biggest question, right? We know they're awesome when healthy. Um, although, as some would point out, the schedule, you know, during that big run wasn't the most strenuous. And the other thing you've mentioned before is, will Tibbs be adaptable enough in a playoff series, especially against you know, elite teams? Are there any other big questions you have about this team? Mm. Or questions in general. I mean, uh, will Randall be good in the playoffs? I would lean no, honestly, with how bad this injury looks. It's just going to be tough. 
but that's it. That's the only question. That's it. Aside from that, I don't really have a question about this team. I feel like I know what this team is. I feel like I know what they're capable of. Um, you know, it's about getting healthy. It's about kind of getting comfortable again. Um, which I don't think I like Reddick talked about it in his pod uh, or not on his pod on ESPN. Like they did this segment where they're like, are the Knicks the biggest threat? And Stephen A wore his Homer hat and was like, yeah, they can beat all these teams. And then like Shannon Sharp was like, they don't have Dave Lillard. They don't have Giannis. They suck. And then Reddick was like, I'd still take Milwaukee because I don't know how they look together healthy, but the, how quickly they became awesome with OG. I don't yeah. think they need like an like the adjustment period part of like getting comfortable again together. Maybe with Mitch, that throws a little bit of a wrench in the situation. But they they like they flick the switch immediately at, when, during the OG trade, and Randall and him fit together pretty seamlessly. And that's the biggest question, right? How does Randall fit with anyone? And and he deserves credit for adapting to obviously Brunson. Um, so I don't think that's as big a concern to me, though. You know, you'd like to see them get to play together for a few games. Um, I honestly think I do wonder a little bit. You know, Deuce has been awesome. We've seen guys who are great shooters in the regular season. Quickly and Grimes last year struggled to shoot in the playoffs. Uh, I don't think this – Brunson's first playoff, he wasn't very good. Um, this will be beyond just being a defensive specialist last year. This will be Deuce's first playoff experience. Steven Chenzo in the playoffs wasn't great last year either, by the way. Um, so we'll see. I mean, he's clearly grown a lot as a player. Um, I do wonder a little bit, given how we've seen some of the playoff dropping from Knicks who had great, I mean, look at Reggie Bullock, um, you know, um, shot like over 40% from three. I think Deuce and Dante have proven to be more versatile. That is a, a bit of a question to me though. It's like how, how much of what these guys who are, especially the guys who are playing well above their head. Are providing can they can they give you during the playoffs um, because it's clearly a different ball game at that point. Yeah, I mean, I think what helps is a lot of the stuff that happened with Bullock is they were just they they could switch everything and he couldn't do anything. Um, he couldn't attack a switch because that's just not in his toolbox. Um, but more importantly, they didn't really have anybody that could hunt switches effectively aside from um, Derrick Rose. Well, yeah, well, Randall. Randall was terrible in that series, but more importantly, I think like Derrick Rose and Derrick Rose's body just couldn't hold up, right? Um, so they have that now because they have Jalen Brunson, um, who can kill switches, and obviously they would still have Randall, whatever. Like they're just more equipped to handle that overall, and I think that helps guys like you know uh, Deuce and DiVincenzo because teams are gonna have to do things that probably give them openings you know what i mean like our issue in that playoffs last year for example against miami and against cleveland wasn't that we couldn't get open shots it's that we couldn't fucking hit them you would bet that with better shooters which we have now we will hit a better uh, a higher clip of open shots but even even our good shooters like quickly and grimes are missing right i do think dante is a better shooter than both of them and deuce has been really good so but and know. og and og is a better shooter than rj so like i just think you know overall you're talking about an improvement in that area of the team just in terms of perimeter shooting and i'm like we obviously bogdanovich and burks have not shot well or played well in new york but like they're quality shooters too right that the history of their careers i think is enough to say that a bad month and a half here in new york doesn't mean that they can't shoot anymore it's just they're going through it um but yeah, like I, I think that that's really the only thing I, I, I don't, I'm not even that worried about like, Hey, can do some DiVincenzo hold up? I think they can. It's just a matter of doing it um, and, and hitting enough shots. Um, I, but before we uh, kind of wrap up here, uh, we did play the Nets on Saturday and I wanted to talk a little bit about the Nets because uh they're terrible and i have no idea what they're doing uh they don't seem to have any direction as a team both on and off the floor would you call uh, them rudderless i would call them rudderless uh i thought honestly like look deuce is awesome he's been a great he's so good on defense but if you're building your team around or with or whatever however you want to phrase it 
around guys like at the at the size that Mikal Bridges and Cam Johnson are, and they can't effectively attack that size mismatch, seems like a pretty big fucking problem. I mean, I think Mikael Bridges has been miscast. I think he's a good player. Um, he he's the creation. I don't think is going to come at this point. Um, I think he's like a better version of what peak auto porter was and auto porter got a max. So like that is not shade, but very good, reliable shooter um, with some size who can shoot over some guys in the mid range and can, you know, give you versatility on defense, but not really a guy you can ask to create a lot. I think cam Thomas has actually improved in terms of vision, but he's still a very ISO heavy player uh, who doesn't give you anything on defense. Um, and, um, and, you know, shooters are solid vet, but that's not going to move the needle on this team. Claps, they have some solid pieces. I like Claxton a lot. Um, I think he's the third best center in New York, but, um, you know, uh, we can't be perfect. Um, I think it's just, it's incredible, and it's a lesson for the Knicks to 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 consider, right? That, um, that the Nets, they went all in on stars, and maybe, maybe with a different group of stars it would have worked better. Um, but it clearly they went all in and the Nets, you know, for as much as we clown them for overstating it, a guy like Dinwiddie was important to them. Um, guys like, you know, the guys that Harris, right. The guys they built that team with and the culture they built, that was important. And, you know, the, I think most organizations, I'd be lying if I said, would I have traded that at the time for Katie and Kyrie? Absolutely. Um, would I have gone all in to get Harden? Absolutely. But as the Knicks are in this point where yes, they have, I think two legitimate stars and they have a really good supporting cast. And, um, and and I bring this up because I think Billy Reinhardt tweeted it and, you know, Knicks fans clowned him for, you know, probably rightfully so. But I did think he brought up the point that at some point, if it doesn't work out this off season, the Knicks are going to have the question of, I think he was reductive in saying it's just because they don't have a full star. I think the real question as we've talked about so long is, are they better off build leaning into this, you know, Maybe it's a Mikhail Bridges. Maybe it's another. Maybe it's someone who's already on the roster, continuing to develop. Precious taking another step. But um, in terms of continuing to build this team, let's say they get to the Eastern Conference Finals and Tatum is just too much, right? And they don't have um, an answer for that. Or or Giannis and Dame clearly elevate their game, and you know Randall does doesn't show up. Whatever. Um, it will be interesting to see. Because they've done this while maintaining flexibility and while having great role players, and um, they might have to make the choice, you know, between sacrificing some of that for like an all-in move. And at this point, with just how great they looked after the OG trade, I don't think that's necessary. But um, but the playoffs are going to tell them a lot there, and I think the Nets are a cautionary tale on the idea that like going all in on stars doesn't really is far from a sure thing. I mean, the problem the Nets had. Honestly, it's part of the reason why I never really wanted Kyrie. Um, they went all in on three guys that are not stable for different reasons. Right? Kyrie, a lot of just odd stuff off the court. Uh, Kevin Durant coming off an Achilles rupture, how that was managed, you know, how they would manage it, whatever. Um, that's tough. And then James Harden, who is prone to, uh, you know, mercurial behavior. I mean, didn't he have an incident just yesterday or something where he, he walked out of the locker room? He Did walked he? out. Yeah. Like there was an issue. I mean, there, things are going well. I thought he's been playing well there, but um, let me look it up. I just saw a tweet about it. So, yeah. I, I didn't see it. I, again, I was out during the day yesterday. Oh, so. he didn't talk to the media following the Clippers home loss. So. Oh, because they played the Sixers. I, I get it. Yeah. yeah, it's a oh his old team that he spent all of like one and a half seasons with. By the way, um, yeah. So I think that was part of their issue. Um, I think the Knicks have also like they are they're just a lot more stable organizationally than the Nets were. The Nets always felt like look they put together that one like you know they put had that one random playoff season right with. D'Angelo Russell and whatever, they get gentlemen swept. Or no, they was that a, it was gentlemen sweep. Gentlemen sweep in the first round against 
Philly that year. Um, and then they immediately were, okay, well, we can get KD and Kyrie. Okay, so we're kind of, they were not, they had built up a foundation and then they immediately jumped to like, you know, build a fucking skyscraper. And uh, I don't think their foundation was really set. I think the Knicks have a much more stable foundation. It's kind of my point. Like, I think they've built this up gradually over more time. A lot of these players have been here now for a while, right? Randall, Mitch, whatever. Uh, guys like Brunson. Brunson feels like he's been here forever, even though he's only in his second season with the Knicks. Hart has immediately, like, it, it just, it feels a lot more sustainable and whatever. Um, what I'll say, and I'll continue to say it, is, like, I personally think they can probably get, I think they can get Donovan Mitchell at a price that is probably worth it. Um, and I don't think they have to sacrifice a lot of their depth to get him. You'd probably have to give up Deuce, right? I don't know. I I wouldn't. I think you can give up. I would. I I as awesome as DiVincenzo has been. I think you. He's the guy you would send out because you are but basically. If the, are, if the Cavs are trading Mitchell and they want to rebuild, which for me I would be like, no, would they? Your best are we sure they? Are we? Are we sure they want to rebuild? Or are we? I, I don't think they, they don't have the option to rebuild. Like they, they're in the same position the Nets are. They they haven't even started to give away the picks that they traded. like they yeah they that they traded for Mitchell that starts after next season. So 2025, 2027, 2029, those picks are out the door unprotected fully. And they've they give up pick swaps in 2026 and 2028. Like to me they don't have the option to rebuild, and they've already paid Darius Garland. Jared Allen is already locked in, and I'm assuming they're going to pay Mobley, which I hope they do. Please pay Evan Mobley. Please pay Evan Mobley a ton of money. That would be fantastic. Um, but I think Donovan Mitchell is uh, is gettable, and I think that DiVincenzo would actually be an appealing piece to them because, one, he's locked in on a, on a good contract for the next three years. He's younger. He fits next to Garland offensively, gives them a level of shooting, which they obviously need if they're going to persist with this Mobley-Allen thing. Um, and, like, I don't know, dude. Like, I think, you know, if you – I don't know what the exact trade is, but let's say it's, like, DiVincenzo and Bogdanovich. You'd have to send Mitch, Mitch to another team. Yeah. yeah, Mitch goes to a third team or whatever. Like, if that's the deal for Mitchell and, you know, you have to add picks or whatever, like – I don't know, man. I, I think that is a trade the Knicks are now suited to make. Um, and obviously, we got to see what's happening with Mitchell's knee, if that's clean or cleared or whatever. But if if so, um, I mean, it, it just makes more sense to trade for Mitchell now than it did at the time when he was traded from Utah, given that you have OG now. And I think that deuce matters. Um he like having a three guard rotation of Brunson, Mitchell, Deuce would be fucking awesome. And Mitchell addresses their biggest problem this year, which is the offense going to shit when Brunson is not on the floor. He addresses that in a massive way. So I don't know. I'm like, I'm He's a lot more his defense too. So I think, yeah, that I mean, is... a lot of metrics have Mitchell as a flat out better defender than DiVincenzo. So, um, to me, I think that like that is, I, I'm just a lot more interested in Donovan Mitchell than I was when he was traded from Utah. And honestly, I'm a lot more interested in Donovan Mitchell this summer than I am in Joel Embiid. Yeah, that's fair. It's worth noting too. He's pretty good friends with not just Brunson, but I think a lot of the guys on the team. So you know, to the extent that that matters. Um, in in you know, the exit from Utah wasn't great, but perhaps. Um, you know, there are people who felt like he quit a little bit in the playoffs, but um, but he's much less mercurial than, than some of the guys the Nets targeted, right? So probably a cleaner fit in terms of going with the culture. I think Tibbs is a fan of his. You know, Leon Rose is a fan of his. So that could be the move. If I was the Cavs, I still would try not to move off it because Donovan Mitchell has played like an MVP. Um, you know, people talk about the best guard in the East. He's the one guy I actually would put on Brunson's level and say, you know, if you want to say he's better than Brunson, I won't fight you on that. But um, yeah, um, 
you know, I, I still think they don't need to make a star trade at this point, though, with just how good they've looked with OG. It's really helped the only question. Um, I think if, if it doesn't work out in the playoffs, you know, you have a hard conversation about Randall maybe, um, but I think you look for another, you know, you could find another creator off the bench um, to pair with, with McBride. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, it, it could be, a, I don't know what Schroeder's contract situation is like, even he, he next to McBride if is your bench group to like solidify like and that's I'm just throwing a name out right but you don't need to make a big move to stabilize what you said you know in terms of the offense going to shit with Brunson going to the the bench um, you know a little more size in the wing maybe just for, as insurance when OG is out and to just be that much more insane when he's in. But, you know, I think this team is there. Um, maybe they need the reps in the playoffs but um, and a healthy Randall. And I think that's that would really suck because getting that data point on Randall in the playoffs, like I, I, at this point, if he sucks, like I know a lot of people will probably blame him. And to your point, if you're, if you're on the floor, I don't really want to hear about injuries, but it's a dislocated shoulder, you know. Um, so it would be three offs. It would be three playoffs where he didn't play well. And, you know, it's not a shooting shoulder, and, and he's a tough guy, and, and he's, he's matured a lot. He's grown a lot in his time here. So maybe he'll play through it and still be awesome, and that answers your question. But um, but I think one way or the other, that's like a big data point, is like can Randall be a reliable player in the playoffs? And it sucks we might not. I mean, in addition, it suck, sucks for him that he was having such a great season. He's on a contending roster, and he can't be out there. I don't want to understate that point, and and affects our chances. But also in terms of looking forward, it would have been nice to get some more information there. Yeah. Um, that The Randall part of it is obviously the big, you know, uh, who, we, we, it's, we have no idea how it will or will not turn out. Um, I, I, I hope that he's healthy by the playoffs selfishly because you would like to see him play healthy in the playoffs and not have, any kind of like, well, he was hurt or the guy, like this is the best roster they've had in forever. And he's a part of why that's the case, but also like he benefits from the pieces they've put around him or he should benefit from it. And I truly believe this. Like I thought the way he was playing, the level he was playing at the maturity he was showing um, in his play before he got hurt was, I was like, this guy is going to be fine in the playoffs i really i I really believed it that shoulder injury is a big deal though and um you know i would like for him to be healthy again selfishly so that we can just kind of like see it uh and and not have any excuses or whatever but who knows if we will or not but like even aside from that like i mean obviously donovan mitchell is dealing with some knee thing but like and you know small guards and knees and whatever i get that the concern there but like Dude, if you're talking about we got it, if you're under the kind of timeline crunch that we perceive this front office is in terms of like, well, we got to get our big move needs to be this summer. Don't you feel better about betting on Donovan Mitchell than Joel Embiid's health long term? I I know I am. Yeah, I mean, and he's younger, right? So, um, um, I would I would agree with that. Um, yeah, I mean, Embiid is one of the most dominant players um i think like at full health like all things equal like you would take him beat over mitchell he's a better player um he's also i think defensively been much better than people give him credit for in the playoffs um and then the only other thing is like you do get a the, you do get a little bit wary they you know because they're going to extend brunson so you'd be investing a lot of money in two guards right with a lot of overlap and skill set that becomes a little bit that would be my only hesitation there but you know to your point Mitchell's defense has improved they do need some other shot creation and finding that from the wing is frankly really tough there's a reason why like wings like that aren't available um you know so if if they were going to make a move and and the price you know if the price would it would suck to lose DiVincenzo with how well he's been but that's when you're on a good contract and you outplay it. Sometimes that's what happens, right? Um, you get sent, you get valued like that by another team, and, and you get sent for a star. And um, you know, uh, I, I. But to answer your question, yeah, like Amit is what thirty-one now. 
Uh, let's see. I think so. He is 30. 30. He, he just, just turned 30. 30. Um, Mitchell, so Mitchell's what, uh, three years younger than him? That on top of the fact that like he's generally been more durable than than Embiid. Um, you know, yeah, I would have to agree with you there. Um, and he's been, I mean, I think Embiid is better when they're both healthy, but Mitchell has been playing it as well as anybody this year. Yeah, definitely agree. Um, all right. Uh, one one question, sorry, before we yep. leave real quick. How do you feel about cardamom in coffee? Uh, not my favorite, but I'm okay with it. I, yeah, I'm struggling with it. So I think cardamom in, in chai is good. But yeah. in coffee, it's a little, a little weirder in coffee. Yeah, I have to agree with you there. Uh, having it now, and just was curious about your ideas on that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, good other than that. <laughs> awesome. All right, I uh, I have nothing else. So, uh, Stacy, let the people know where they can find you. Plug anything you'd like to plug. Uh, Stacy Patton eighty nine on Twitter. Uh, I would like to plug our first inaugural Emoji Madness tournament um, on the Strict Cord. Um, where we are having a tournament of all of our uh, best emojis, uh, custom emojis uh, on our Discord. Uh, if you want to participate, you can join our Patreon, which uh, Schwinn uh, talked about earlier. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I'll also plug all the great work at the Strickland. Awesome. Uh, I have nothing to plug personally, so I'm just going to plug all the work at Strickland. Check out uh, the podcast, check out the recaps. Everything everybody's doing is wonderful. Um, and yes, the Emoji Madness uh, bracket is going fantastically well. All right. Uh, that is our show for today. Thank you to our sponsors, Bet Online and Cut. Uh, the Knicks play tonight against Detroit. Hopefully, they get that win. Um, so join us for the post game there. And uh, I will be back on Friday to drop the pod with Prez. Everybody have a great week, and I'll see you then.